This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is TWIM This Week in Microbiology, episode 160, recorded on August 31st, 2017. This episode is brought to you by the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, part of the U.S. Department of Defense. The agency's Chemical and Biological Technologies Department hosts the 2017 Chemical and Biological Defense Science and Technology Conference to exchange information on the latest and most dynamic developments for countering chemical and biological weapons of mass destruction. Find out more at cbdstconference.com. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello. Last day of August, right? Yeah, it's move-in week. (laughs) We've got (laughs) cars parked every which way and people hauling big I'm sure. Barrels of things. It's exciting. You can feel the excitement and the nervous tension in the air. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I went, we brought our kids. We have two kids now in college. One Saturday, we drove to Poughkeepsie and back. And then Sunday, we drove to Ithaca and back. Oh, wow. <laughs> and then last night, we moved our son into his apartment in Hoboken because he's now in the workforce. Wow. Yay! I can't so believe are, it. It went so quickly. You know, Michelle, it's like, boom. It's true. <laughs> are any of your kids um, in a fir- in their first year of college? No, they're both second year now. Okay, good. So it was a little easier on mom and dad then. Oh, yeah. No problem. Okay. It's mm-hmm. fine. It, uh, it was fine. It's just driving so long. It was two hours back and forth one day and then four and a half hours the other day. You know. Yeah. Oh, well, that's fine. Yeah. This at least is- you didn't have to deal with floods. Oh, man, yeah. Those poor people in Houston. It's terrible, I, terrible. Oh, yeah. Boy, we've been thinking about all of the people in that area. It's and, you know, really there's, tragic. Uh, and then there's Galveston, right? Which Did they get uh, some flooding, too, there? Do you know? Not mm-hmm. as bad as Houston. Because that's where the BSL-4 is, right? Yeah. yeah. Of course, Houston has Baylor with a lot of science as well. Right. Boy, it's really bad. I guess uh, it has something to do with the climate of the planet, doesn't it? That's what all the papers are saying. Yeah. <laughs> Warmer water temperatures, yeah. creating just the storm held more moisture and just kept dumping it. Not much you can do when you're near the coast. I, have, You know, we went through Sandy here in the Northeast uh, a number of years ago. Michael, you did too, right? I guess. Yeah. We had a lot of flooding and a lot of damage, but not as bad as Houston. So, well, good luck to everyone. We We need to do more about science education because in today's local newspaper, there was a letter to the editor asking the question, why is it that we cannot fly a plane over these storms and dump 32 degree water on the storm to dampen the energy? <laughs> Boy. <Please>. And <laughs> I, I, I just, I think the, the writer of that uh, letter to the editor was just naive thinking about how much water a plane can actually hold. Yeah, and who would be dumping who? The plane yes. dumping on the storm or the storm dumping the storm plane? wouldn't even make I, a difference. I, I mean, it's we, we need to do something about science education. You only have to look at the horrific fires that we have had out west, and you can see these gigantic old DC-10s and L-10-11s just pouring fire retardant down, and the entire plane is empty of its contents within 10 seconds. Yeah. So I, I cannot imagine on a storm, the scale uh, of Harvey, how they could ever get enough planes in the air to dump enough energy yeah. into that storm to lessen its effect. Once the storm started, there's not much you can do except leave. And that's hard. Yeah. One thing I saw yesterday that's very interesting is these, I think it's fire ants. In order oh, to yeah. avoid the water, that. they make these biofilms. They link their legs together. They make these big mats. They protect the queen, and they float. Isn't that it incredible? Floats. It's like it it's like a biofilm, right? Yeah, it is a truly. It's a macro film. It it's is. big. It's really amazing. And in uh, Katrina, they couldn't form those because the water came in too quickly and it killed them all before they could respond. But that's very interesting. 
All right, today we actually do have some microbiology. So, Michael, I agree with you. You know, the three of us, four of us on this show, we can do microbiology, but mm-hmm. we, we can't do hurricanes and no and uh, storm control and that sort of thing. It's up to other people. So that's right. We cannot do every podcast in the world. No, we can do microbiology, and today I think is kind of a virus themed episode. Last time or two times ago, Elio had said offline, why don't you give us an update on Zika, what's happening? And of course, over on TWIV, we talk about Zika quite regularly. And I look back at the TWIM archive, and we've never actually talked about Zika virus. And there's some people who probably don't listen to TWIV, but listen to TWIM. (laughs) So we don't want to leave you out. So let me spend 15 minutes or so uh, talking about Zika virus. And I should say that this is a virus we did begin to work on uh, towards the end of 2015. And I, I, it's a virus in a different family from polio virus, which I spent my whole career working on. But we were interested in it for reasons that will become clear. All right, so Zika virus was first identified in 1947 in Uganda in the forest of the same name. Uh, it was isolated from a monkey that was actually in a cage in the forest that was a sentinel monkey. They were trying to track virus infections. And back then, that's one of the ways they did it. And this monkey got a fever and they took some blood and they isolated a brand new virus, which they called Zika virus. It wasn't isolated from humans until 1954. And over the next 50 years, there were less than 20 reported human cases. So from 1947 to the almost 2000 or so. This is a virus that is spread among humans principally by a mosquito Aedes aegypti. So very quiet. Now, the the disease is very mild, so no one really paid much attention to it. It was fever, rash, conjunctivitis, joint pain, and so didn't raise any eyebrows for a very, very long time. Until 2007, there was really the first outbreak in the Pacific on on an island called Yap Island. Uh, That was the first outbreak outside of Africa. The virus spread apparently slowly, from Africa to Asia, and eventually it reached the Pacific. Yap Island, there are, at the time, there were 6,800 residents, and 5,000 of them got infected. So apparently the virus was brought onto the island by an infected person or a mosquito, and there's no immunity, so boom, big outbreak. A couple of years later, same thing, French Polynesia outbreak, 2014 uh, outbreaks in the Pacific, 2015. So this virus is spreading throughout the the Pacific. But again, the disease is pretty mild. So nobody is really paying much attention to it until 2015. It arrives in Brazil. So it's moving eastward from Africa to Asia to the Pacific, gets into Brazil. And again, it's never been in these places. And when you introduce a new pathogen into a immunologically naive population, you have outbreaks. In Brazil, it was a huge outbreak beginning in the northeastern part of the country. And so, Vincent, yes. did it get into Brazil as a consequence of the soccer matches or the football matches, or did that ever get run to ground? So, the people have done some analysis, and uh, you know, you can look at all the isolates and do some molecular clock calculations in it. it doesn't seem to be the the, the uh, football, the soccer is not the right timing. It probably came in even in 2014. Uh, so, so that's one of the myths that gets debunked. Yeah, I don't think it was science. decided. I mean, there was some other tournament, but I'm not sure the timing is correct. And so it was probably one of these chance things that a traveler came in and brought it from a, a place where the virus was. So just to clarify, Michael, you weren't implying that the sport itself uh, oh, no, did something no, no. with the virus, but rather it's <laughs> it's a it's a large enterprise and the travel, international yeah, travel. travel. It's the uh-huh. fans and the contestants and just the sheer volume of air travel from these remote places to right. participate in the tournament. It's effectively complementing what Vincent was saying about herd immunity. You you bring in a person or persons that are infected effectively bringing in the virus that then starts the event because right. you effectively have a naive community. Much like college freshmen that travel across the exactly. country <laughs> to, well, and then introduce their favorite Absolutely, absolutely. Or, or yeah. uh, 
Well, that's why they vaccinate for Neisseria meningitidis. Yep. And that's why many college freshmen got the shot because you're now in a crowded situation, living in a dorm, eating in the same common venue, and they're concerned about those things. So this concept of herd immunity is is very important, which is why vaccination is is so important. Same thing happens when you put military recruits together, right? They're all Absolutely. together. Lots of people for the first time, and if one of them has a virus, boom. So you get outbreaks. So probably in, in Brazil in 2014, probably a year before we recognize. Now, the reason we recognized and made made something of the outbreak in Brazil, because from a very early point, it was a, it seemed to be associated with uh, congenital birth defects, in particular microcephaly, babies born with smaller than normal skull circumference. And there were reports of thousands of cases uh, in this particular area of Brazil coinciding with this outbreak of Zika virus infection. And for a long time, it was an association until finally a number of studies were published showing that, yes, indeed, infection predisposes. If you are infected first or second trimester of pregnancy, you're, you have a chance of having a baby that has uh, microcephaly. So microcephaly happens when the outer layers of the brain, the neocortex, are thinner than they should be. So the brain is smaller and hence the skull is smaller. And that is... The, the virus getting into the brain of the fetus was what interested us in um, working on Zika, which I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about later. Meanwhile, the virus kept spreading throughout much of South America. It can only spread where the vector is, so it doesn't go all the way to the to the very tip of South America because the, the mosquitoes aren't there. It's too cool. Many countries in South and Central America, Caribbean, Puerto Rico, had a very, very big outbreak, and eventually it went back to Africa, so it made a circuit around the world and made it uh, by the tourist trade to Africa. There were a number of imported cases in the U.S. that is travel-related. People would travel to areas where Zika uh, was endemic or was infecting people. They'd come back to the U.S., develop symptoms. And it wasn't until last year that there was a local outbreak in Miami. And uh, that was clearly locally spread infection via Aedes aegypti. Uh, and um, I think in the end, 250 people got infected in that outbreak. That outbreak is now over. Now, in addition to microcephaly, it's now clear that infection in utero can cause other uh, congenital birth problems with the, with the CNS. It can cause eye problems, probably will cause other problems as the child develops, um, not just um, motor problems, but cognitive problems as well. We're just starting to learn this because it's a relatively rare uh, infection, of course. And this is not unusual for viruses because that's, why, after all, why we vaccinate for MMR, the measles, mumps, and rubella. Rubella, of course, is another one of these right. bad viruses that has all sorts of unwelcome consequences to uh, a fetus. Absolutely. In fact, that's why we develop the uh, rubella vaccine because it's clearly associated with congenital birth defects. Even though we have a vaccine, many people globally don't get it. And there's still tens of thousands of cases of what we call congenital rubella syndrome every year, babies born to mothers who are infected. Uh, Cytomegalovirus is another virus that causes um, birth defects as well. So, you know, this one was scary because it was spread by a mosquito. So you have less control over it. I mean, rubella and um, cytomegalovirus are caused by or spread by secretions right so you have a little bit of a more of a control over it but uh you know we i always reminded people this is not the first virus in fact there there are what we call the torch pathogens you know toxoplasma uh, rubella cytomegalovirus and others o stands for others and now zika is in the o of the torch pathogens hmm. so this is a Normally, a very mild infection, as I said, the rash, fever, joint pain, conjunctivitis, and a headache, very similar to dengue, chikungunya infections, short incubation period, two to 10 days, only 20% of infected people develop symptoms. So you can be infected and not know it, and uh, rare fatalities. Now, we learned early on that uh, the virus can be shed from, it's not just present in blood, it can be shed and it can be sexually transmitted. Uh, that, that is probably a very rare occurrence. But it can be sexually transmitted. The virus replicates in testes, 
Uh, in fact, studies in mice have shown that the virus can replicate there and uh, can spread sexually. It's also uh, shed in the saliva but um, and urine, but it's, those probably don't contribute to transmission, although you could use those for a diagnosis. Do we have very good numbers for how often? Sexual transmission? Uh, it's tra- yeah. Well, according to the CDC, this is a number from last year, one, about 1%. Mm-hmm. And the and the microcephaly that's harder to nail down, but that seemed to be about ten percent. And the, how does that how does that compare to HIV, for example? Sexual transmission. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Almost all all transmission of HIV is either through blood products, uh, intravenous drug use, or sex. So yeah, I guess I'm wondering um, what are the odds of getting of, of transmitting one in a hundred of HIV is like one in uh, two hundred. And and with um, it's much less for Zika. I don't think I've much seen less for numbers. Zika. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's really important to point out the main transmission for Zika is by mosquitoes. The main transmission for HIV is sex and blood. Right. So, um, but nevertheless, the CDC is recommending. You know, if you are if you want to be pregnant, you shouldn't travel to endemic areas, or you shouldn't have your partner travel to endemic areas. And if you do, you should wait six months before you know trying to have a baby and that sort of thing. Right. And use barrier methods yeah, for you should definitely use condoms. Yep. Mm-hmm. So many. So the situation now is that um, there is still uh, ongoing uh, outbreaks or, or infections. There's a wonderful website maintained by the Pan American Health Organization, and they give a regular regional Zika update. The last one was August 25th. I'll put a link to this to this page in the show notes. There has been there have been some. Um, Cases in Mexico, uh, there's a little, there was a big burst of cases, hundreds of cases last year, and this year they're uh, less than 100, but there's there's a little bit of a blip going on this year. Uh, there are some, in Central America, there, there are a few, but many, many fewer cases than last year. If you look at these graphs, you have huge blips up to the thousands of cases, and now this year it's less than 100 um, because, uh, you know, last year, the virus spread extensively and immunized a lot of people, and now you have population immunity that is um, limiting the spread of infection, which is good. Uh, but at the same time, many, many companies have started to develop vaccines against Zika virus, and there are over 15 different kinds of vaccines of all sorts that have been tested in animals. They look good. And the next step is to put them in people. But if you don't have cases, you really can't test a vaccine. All right. <laughs> right. Because so you don't a, know if it's going to work. Yeah, because what you do is you would take, you know, a thousand people and give them the vaccine and another thousand you wouldn't, that would be your control. And then you'd follow them for the next year and see who got Zika and who didn't. And if there isn't very much Zika, you're not going to get numbers that will give you any confidence that your vaccine is working. And it's obviously unethical to do a direct test. That's right. With this virus, virus, yeah, you can't challenge people. With other viruses like rhinovirus and some influenza viruses, you can do challenge, but not with most viruses, including this one. That's right. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm not sure what the status is of the clinical trials. I'm sure they're being planned at the moment, but where, I'm not sure. At the same time, many people have tested antivirals. And many antivirals do work in animal models, and they would have to be tested in people as well. So that's where we are at the moment. There's a little bit of uh, infection going on globally, uh, but far less than previous year. It still remains a threat because as more people are born who are not immune, eventually they will build up the numbers and there'll be outbreaks. You know, maybe every five, six, or seven years there'll be an outbreak, unless we have a vaccine, of course. So making a vaccine is really important. And so testing it is really key. But this is really a good example of how a very highly infectious virus can literally circle the globe very quickly and then watch how it burns itself out because there's no longer any potential host. And it, you're yeah, really yeah. playing a statistical game For sure. where, you're, yeah. where you're hoping that the mosquito with the virus finds a naive host because – once you have the virus, you've made antibody 
to it. And even if you get bitten by a mosquito that has a virus, your antibodies are going to effectively prevent subsequent infection. So if you then get bit by a naive mosquito, you're going to be unable to carry that infection forward. And once a mosquito bites, it's dead. Now, what do you mean it's dead? Well, once it has taken the blood meal from you, it's it's effectively finished. It's not going to uh, move itself on to more host. Well, it depends. So, so female mosquitoes take blood meals only, and that's so that they can lay eggs, right? Mm-hmm. So the female mosquito, if it has enough blood, will go off and lay eggs, but they can re rebite. I mean, the lifespan is not very long. It's a couple of weeks. So, you know, they, they, in theory though, they could bite multiple people and that does Yeah, happen. I was, I was going for the female running off to, to lay the eggs to advance the next generation. Because obviously that's how it's spread, right? A right. mosquito takes a blood meal and then, you know, you, a female mosquito could even lay eggs. The virus is replicating in the female mosquito. It's, it goes to the gut. It, it enters the blood system, gets to the salivary glands, replicates, and then when that mosquito takes another blood meal, then it will spread it to you. And so it, by definition, you know, the mosquitoes have to ha- have more than one blood meal. Otherwise, they wouldn't transmit it. Right? Yeah. Right. So, Vincent, while I was preparing for my first-year seminar that I'll be teaching, um, I found TWIV episode 429, right. where you interviewed a person who is – developing a rhesus monkey model to study Zika infection. So that might be an alternative strategy to, to develop and test some vaccines. Yes, for or sure. You could supplement. You could, but you still have to, of course, test them. Safety testing in, people, in humans. For sure. Yep. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, you might not even need a, a non-human primate if you could use, you know, a lot of people are using mice mm-hmm. um, and that might be sufficient. But, uh, yeah, you could test them in, in non-human primates. But eventually you have to do, you know, a, a, a clinical trial, three different clinical trials, uh, phase, right. phase one, two, and three. It takes a long time. But especially in a situation like this where you can't predict where the next outbreak will be, the um, ability to go to a non-human primate model I think is very important. Yeah. So we got interested in Zika because it infects the brain. And the virus I worked on my whole career, polio virus is a neurotropic virus. So we were interested in saying, what can we contribute to understanding Zika and the fetus? So we've developed, along with our collaborator here, Richard Valley, a really interesting model where we take fetal mice and we, we remove the brain, we make slices of the brain, we put them in culture, and we can then infect them with Zika virus. And we could see what the virus does to the development of these brain slices because they continue to develop in culture. Uh, and the neurons proliferate and they migrate to the neocortex, and we can see how Zika virus infection perturbs that. And uh, we're trying to figure out the mechanism of that now. We've just written our first paper on this up. It's up at BioArchive, actually. All right. uh, We've submitted it. It's under review. But uh, if you're interested, you can go over to BioArchive. And I'll, I'll put a link for that in the show notes. But That that must be so uh, exciting to, to switch to a new model like that and develop this new uh, experimental system. It is. And you know what else? It's also, it also influences our other work. At the same time, you know, we were slowly moving away from polio virus. And one of the other polio-like viruses we began to work on was antrovirus 68, which the respiratory virus has been associated recently with neurological symptoms in kids. And we have taken this, this brain slice culture. These are organotypic cultures. And we made them from adult, from newborn mice, and we can infect them with antivirus 68 and study how that virus is neurotropic as well. So oh, cool. we would never have done that if we hadn't started to work on Zika virus, right? So that whole culture system now is is driving the laboratory. So uh, it's, and that paper has also been submitted, and that's on BioArchive as well. That's great. Yeah, it's exciting. And I think uh, our interest is not in making a vaccine for Zika or antivirals. We'd like to know how the virus perturbs the development of the nervous system. So that's why we switched. A lot of people switched to it because, you know, the idea that maybe you could get funding to work on it, right? That hasn't panned out, (laughs) but um, it's an interesting virus to work on. And it's still important, despite there not being huge numbers of cases, it will be back and we do need to make a vaccine for this because you're going to have vulnerable populations always. 
And what you learn with this virus may very well accelerate research on the next virus in this family. Absolutely. And people now are doing interesting things with mosquito control. They're trying to figure out, well, can we modify mosquitoes, like put Wolbachia into them and release them and make them Mm -hmm. less hospitable for virus replication? So it's kind of, it's stimulating a broader swath of research than just Zika virus. And that's the nature of good science, right? Right, right. It's it's quite interesting. It answers questions and creates more. Should. It absolutely should. So, yes, we're we're very excited about this. And uh, doing something new is kind of neat, right? Especially when you spend your whole career doing one thing. That's why you get up in the morning. That's why you get up in the morning. That's right. Is it also humbling? Oh, for sure. Yeah, I mean... (laughs) I have to tell you, Michelle, we have written uh, six grant proposals and none of them have been funded yet <laughs> on Zika, <laughs> on Zika, because uh, I think um, maybe people think we're, or view us as not specialists in that particular virus, which is unfortunate, but um, well, it's not probably easy. once you get a track record, you, these papers get published, then it's... I'm hoping. I'm yeah. hoping. Otherwise, I'll just be doing podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a great way to contribute. But I shouldn't say just because it's not mm. just. It's really important. If, if right. I if I podcasted the rest of my uh, career, I would be very happy to do that, especially with wonderful colleagues like you guys. Yeah, <laughs> well, count me you. in. I'll join you. <laughs> so that's Zika. Is that good? Does that uh, answer? That that brings us up to date, and it's it's a good way to to think about the poor people in Houston during the flooding because Houston on the map of the CDC of new Zika cases was looking the same color as Florida. Mm. And they certainly are going to have plenty of mosquitoes after this flooding. Yeah, that's true. Hurricanes tend to do that. They tend to blow mosquitoes into areas and of course all the water and so forth. So yeah, that would be interesting to look at. So, you know, there, there is 80s Egypti throughout the mid and Southern part of the U S but mostly transmission of viruses by Aedes aegypti happens either in Florida or in Texas. And, and local transmission of Zika has only been in, in Florida so far, in Miami in particular. So it'll be interesting to see if it happens in Texas after this. We'll see. Yeah. And remember, New Mexico is immediately adjacent to Texas, and it has had no cases of Zika. And so you, even though Texas claims to be a big state, You wonder if the mosquitoes will make their way all the way to New Mexico and Arkansas, which also borders Texas, as to whether or not they'll actually see their first case of Zika. Yep. Very interesting questions. All right. Let's, uh, before we go on to our paper, I want to tell you about the sponsor of this episode, which is the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. Imagine a scenario, an everyday inexpensive drone you could buy online. That's been modified by terrorists to spread chemical or biological weapons over, say, a crowded football stadium or a parade that could have plague, VX, sarin, weaponized influenza virus. How would we treat the victims? How could we counteract the effects? How could we even prevent a scenario like this from happening? They're all interesting questions. Join us in Long Beach, California, November 28th through 30th for the 2017 Chemical and Biological Defense Science and Technology Conference exchange information on the latest and most dynamic developments for countering chemical and biological weapons of mass destruction. Collaborate with more than 1,500 scientists, subject matter experts, military service members, industry partners, and academic leaders from across the globe who are committed to making the world safer by confronting chem biodefense challenges. Part of the U.S. Department of Defense and charged with safeguarding our warfighters, and our nation, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency's Chemical and Biological Technologies Department hosts this important conference and brings together the best and brightest from around the world. So join them at this conference to share your important ideas. For more information about the conference and to register, again, it's going to be November 28th in Long Beach, California. You can go to cbdstconference.com. You can get more information about the conference there or on their Facebook page, just search for D-O-D-D-T-R-A on Facebook, or you can follow them on Twitter, CBDST Conference, all one word, on Twitter. It's the 2017 CBDSNT Conference, Today's Innovation, Tomorrow's Warfighter Capabilities. We have a really um, provocative paper, I think, this week, 
for you. It was published in Nature Microbiology. Title is A Plasmid from an Antarctic Halo Archaean uses specialized membrane vesicles to disseminate and infect plasmid-free cells. And the authors are Suzanne Erdman, Bernard Sichico, Ling Zhang, Mark Rafferty, and Riccardo Cavicchioli. And these authors are from the University of New South Wales in Australia. And um, this is all about archaea, uh, which, as we know, there are bacteria, there are eukarya, and there are archaea, the three so-called domains of life. We don't talk about archaea very much. That's because they don't cause disease. Don't cause or disease. so we don't think. Yeah, we should, but we should talk about them because they are microbes, of course. And, they are indeed. And they are quite old. And they happen to be infected with viruses. And they also have plasmids. And um, in this in this paper, they're trying to understand how the plasmid would get from one cell to another. You know, plasmids, of course, are extra chromosomal elements that can replicate in the host cell. And they can, as the host cells divide, of course, they will partition among the two cells. But they can also, in bacteria, we know that plasmids can travel in other ways, like by conjugation or by the movement of naked DNA. So they wanted to look at how this, how plasmids and archaea can move. And they were looking at a strain of archaea from the Antarctic, <laughs> from the Rauer Islands. <laughs> and this strain uh, is called Halo Rubrum Lacus Profundi, R1S1. And they were looking at this um, by electron microscopy and they saw round virus-like particles, about 80 to 110 nanometers in diameter in the cultures. All right, so you could easily see these. They have a picture of them uh, here, quite clear. Uh, they're, they're, they look like blebs, maybe, blebs. blebs off the surface of the cell. Yeah, yes. in one of the pictures, they're showing them budding from the cell surface, mm -hmm. which is a way that uh, membranous vesicles are formed from many different cell types. And they can get these from the culture supernatants. And within these virus-like particles, there is a circular double-stranded DNA of about 50 kilobases. Which is a fair-sized plasmid. It's a good-sized plasmid, it. yeah. Because, you know, we work with PBR322, which uh, I forgot how big it was. Do you remember? About it's less, it's less, less than, than 3 kb. Less, less than, than 3, 3 kb. Of course, that was a human-made plasmid, right? Yes. Be, for gene transfer. But plasmids can get but, pretty big, though, right? Yeah, the garden variety E. coli fertility plasmid uh, is about 100,000 base pairs, and it's about two minutes in length if you're measuring DNA with your watch. And, something, <laughs> and some, well, the reason it's two minutes in length is they were measuring how long it took for a conjugal transfer of That's that right. plasmid to move from one bacterium to another. And that, of course, was yeah. work done by the very famous Nobel laureate, Josh Letterberg. I remember when plasmid maps had time on them yes. because of that. Nowadays, yeah. we can sequence them and we don't need the, the clock anymore. <laughs> that was really and, and we electroporate everything in anyway. That's so. right. That's right. You know, just a that's, what, that's what's really <laughs> fascinating about this is you had these investigators look at an electron micrograph and they were following the old adage, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it, it must be, a, be duck. a duck. That's right. And they were looking at these blebs, and they really do look like viruses. And the whole story of the paper that they take us through is they're asking the question, is it a virus or is it simply a plasmid that's encased in membrane? And then does the membrane facilitate the transfer of plasmid from – uh, an organism that has the plasmid to an organism that doesn't have the flat plasmid. And what they learned is indeed that that membrane vesicle that held that bundle of DNA literally moved from point A that had it. And like all good plasmids, it replicates itself before it packages it up, self up to send it to its neighbor. And it literally went from uh, a cell that had a plasmid to another cell. And it's, it's very similar to, if you think about it, the early models of transduction, 
albeit specialized transduction, because in specialized transduction, you might recall that the virus, and these are bacteriophages principally, integrate their genome into the host chromosome. And when they integrate their genome into the host chromosome, they have a sophisticated set of viral genes that make certain that the virus lives happily in the chromosome until things get hostile. And then all of a sudden the virus says things are bad, we're no longer wanted, and it's time to leave. And as that virus is getting ready to leave and it's expressing various pro viral proteins, and one of those viral proteins is a nicking enzyme that facilitates the lifting of the viral genome out. And because of how viruses get themselves inserted into the chromosome, and most of this is known from prophage lambda, and when it makes that mistaken endonuclease cut, you effectively get a specialized transducing phage where it grabs DNA either from the right or the left of its insertion site based on where the mistaken cut took place. And you end up with a specialized transducing phage that not only has viral DNA, but also has host DNA. So, in so this Michael, Michael, let's not get too far ahead because th this no. story really builds beautifully. <laughs> right. um, I was going to say from just looking at these EMs, we have to remember that all cells make these blebs, like mm -hmm. Neisseria meningitidis that we were talking about is famous for releasing lots of blebs. Right. So just from these pictures alone, it's not clear whether um, it's just a passive transport of some plasma DNA that happens to get in or whether it's instead a, a more intentional cooperative process. So yeah. that's the, the research yeah. that, that we're going to hear about, isn't it, Vincent? So they, they, <laughs> they purified these vesicles or virus-like particles. They could add them to an uninfected strain and that strain would get infected. You could recover the same kind of vesicles from the supernatant of that strain. So it looked like by simply adding these vesicles, you could transfer the plasma to a new strain. If you took the DNA out of the um, vesicles and treated them with DNAs, then, of course, you don't transfer the plasmid anymore. So you, the transfer requires these membrane vesicles to go from cell to cell. So I think if you simply added the DNA by itself, it wouldn't get into the other uh, archaeal cell. You need this membrane in order to do that. So there's a plasmid inside these vesicles, and it can travel from cell to cell by uh, somehow this, these vesicles fusing to the cell and getting inside. They sequenced this DNA, of course, 50 KB, 48 open reading frames, so 48 potential proteins. None of these, um, let's see, none of them are in the host genome, I believe. Correct. Uh, None of them, right, Michael? None of them were host uh, archaeal sequences. Right. They're specific to the plasmids. And they have some uh, signature sequences of, uh, of of proteins that are known like... Uh, um, the origin of replication right, for the plasmid. Origin and a toxin gene. Uh, they have uh, transposases, which would be important for this thing to move around, uh, and integrase. But no, but no, here's the important part. None of these proteins look like viral structural proteins. So a capsid protein or a membrane protein, none of them look like that. And they don't have any polymerase motifs as, at all. So it doesn't look like a virus. It looks more like a plasmid. And that's what they end up calling it, a plasmid, <laughs> right? It just happens to be encased in this membrane. I, I was really amazed as they led us through what um, predicted functions were for each, well, for many of the open reading frames, especially were you going to talk about the proteins that were predicted to be COP1-like, making coated vesicles? Yeah, I, I was going to get to that at some point. Great, yeah. great. So they, they do some mass spectrometry on these vesicles, and they find that, in fact, many of these proteins are in the vesicles. Right, So they know the sequence of them from the plasmid sequence. And the mass spectrometry gives you the sequence of the proteins. Purify the vesicles, uh, extract the proteins, uh, sequence them by mass spectrometry. And um, you can find many of those proteins in the vesicles themselves. 
and something like 10 of 14 from one of the re- proteins from one of the regions of the plasma were found in the virus like particles but this is important not in host cell membranes they seem to be specific to the virus like particles so these have dna in them these particles and they have proteins that are encoded uh, by the dna and they go through some of these proteins uh the most uh, abundant is called ORF8, open reading frame 8, um, that seems to um, has a signal protein, a signal peptide and might be secreted. They think it might have uh, a kinase or a chaperone function. The second most abundant is ORF6, uh, which seems to be embedded in the membrane of these uh, vesicles, and they think uh, it might be involved in interaction with other proteins. And this ORF6 has a domain uh, which is called WD40, which uh, some of you may know that there is a lubricant called WD40, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to wonder if you were going to do that. Is that. It's in a can. You spray it, I think, right? Yeah. something like that. A nice blue can. Oh, yeah, that's right. And so they have a protein, a repeat domain called WD40 domain, and they're they're useful for protein-protein interactions. And they're often found in what are called COP1 and COP2-coated vesicles, clathrin-coated vesicles, intracellular vesicles. And these are all proteins that are involved in vesicle transport. So that would be cool because these maybe it would be a mechanism for these to fuse uh, to, the, to the cell on quote-unquote infection, if you will. Mm-hmm. And, I was, and I was intrigued by ORF25 that they called the secretion slash conjugal transfer ATPase given the significance of um, the major protein produced by this particular plasmid, mm-hmm. which is thought to be secreted. And I was disappointed that they, didn't, they probably don't have the evidence yet to comment as to whether or not that's being secreted by the public export system of the archaea, which is very similar to the public export system in bacteria. And the other aspect is they didn't comment on the significance of the ether-linked lipids of the archaea with respect to mm-hmm. these membrane vesicles. Yeah. But this yep. is early days, it as, is Elio early. Would, yep. as Elio would say. But the amount of work with the mass spectrometer just blew me away. And what a rich list they got. I mean, yeah. if, oh, you, yeah. if you gave students a project like, okay, design <laughs> um, a living entity that can transfer from one to another, like what kind of motifs or what, what functions would you want to endow it with? You'd come up with a lot of the proteins that they discovered. That's right. It's very cool. Here's a question. With this addiction molecule, could you effectively harvest this membrane entity and if this membrane entity could be taken up by bacteria that were multi-drug resistant, and if the plasmid were able to be expressed in the garden variety drug-resistant bacterium, would that addiction protein then kill the microbe? Right. So the addiction protein is something you need in conjunction with something else to maintain the pla- – to maintain the, Right. Otherwise, the host is killed, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question because we don't know what the antidote would be in this case, right? No, because we we didn't learn about the antidote and whether the antidote is made on the host genome. Um, I I didn't find, but I'm sure they have this. Uh, yeah. The the host sequenced. The one protein I was interested in is FTSE. F T S Z. Remember, these are uh-huh. these tubulin like proteins in mm. bacteria, right? They're involved in septation and cell division. Right. I found it interesting because there's some real clear evidence from other work that some viral structural proteins that we have today are derived from fitzy like proteins. They're, you know, they evolved from fitzy proteins. So this could be, you know, in the end, they're going to suggest that this may be a viral precursor and having fitzy in there would be consistent with that too. Pretty interesting. Yeah. So here's an experiment for Michelle's first year students. Take the, <laughs> take the FTSZ protein from this organism, which is in the database, and then compare it to some of these viral tubulin-like proteins that Vincent was just talking about and ask the question, are they similar? Yeah, you could do that. Right. If you want to do a, a paper experiment. Yeah. In, yeah. in silico. In silico. They uh, also found that as they're propagating this in culture, they found that after three months, 
the DNA content of this plasmid increased. And they, what they find is that it's uh, integrating into the host genome and then coming out, as Michael talked about earlier, and with it pulling host DNA, taking host DNA sequences with it. So the plasmid size goes up and um, you get the host cell DNA incorporated into it. So that would be a mechanism of moving DNA from cell to cell, obviously. And that's pretty neat. Host, host DNA. Yep. Host DNA. That's right. Mm -hmm. They also went back to uh, Antarctica and they said, can we find these plasmids in other isolates? And indeed, they do find multiple, they call these PRIs or PR1SE, but I call them RISE because they translate the one into an I. Uh, PRIS isolates, they get multiple uh, plasmids that are apparently in vesicles, can integrate and excise from the host genome and form uh, these, what do they call them, plasmid vesicles, PV? Is yeah, that, PV, that, plasmid that, vesicles. That's the name. Uh, of course, PV for me is poliovirus, so <laughs> I can remember that. So that's the bottom line. You have a plasmid. Now, this is, uh, this is novel, right? A plasmid that requires a vesicle to go from cell to cell. Isn't that correct? Yes. Yeah. Certainly in archaea, it's novel. But in bacteria, you don't see that either, do you? I'm, I'm, no. No? Okay. So um, this, the, in the discussion, they, they say this is not conjugation because um, it's different from, from that process of DNA going from cell to cell, and you need a vesicle for this to happen. So they, they say, is it a plasmid or is it a virus? Now. In my view, a virus needs to have some kind of a capsid or some kind of structure around it, right? So this, mem as far as we know, this is a membrane vesicle with DNA in it. So it doesn't quite get well, there but it's yet, right? Embedded in it is um, our plasmid encoded proteins, proteins so which is unusual. Yeah, it's not a lip. It's, it's not a liposome with naked DNA right. in it. Has features, so it has features of a virus, right, Michelle? Of an That's enveloped right. virus, right? Yeah, but it's quite not not quite there yet. It doesn't have, for well, it doesn't need to have DNA polymerization enzymes because there are many viruses we know of that have that don't have those, right? Mm -hmm. um, so why isn't it a virus? <laughs> <laughs> it it operationally fits the definition of virus. It's exploiting the whole cell machine. It's not capable of replicating by itself without host proteins. Mm -hmm. um, so it does meet all the criteria of a virus. And, and it's just unusual in that of how this plasmid moves from one microbe to the other. And that's what's unusual. But there are instances in um, nature with eukaryotic viruses, we have enveloped viruses out there. And we also have naked eukaryotic viruses that look more like prokaryotic bacteriophage. That's I right. mean, they, That's right. and norovirus is a good example of a naked virus and it's resistant to disinfectants, whereas the enveloped viruses are very susceptible to disinfectants. Mm -hmm. and, and so this plasmid entity in this membrane vesicle and again, that's why I made the comment about the ether versus ester linked lipids. I was wondering whether or not this will make this a more recalcitrant or capsid like structure mm -hmm. than because it may be resistant to the normal everyday degradative chemicals that are out in Mother Nature trying to get at that precious DNA. So, yeah, I agree. I think this has um, got a lot of features of of a virus. One of the, if it were an envelope virus, it would have to have viral proteins in the membrane. And maybe they have some here that allow it to attach to host cells, right? Uh, well, that's right. what the mo their model suggests. They say that this, in the last paragraph of the paper, the discovery of this plasmid provides a precedent for how viruses might have emerged from plasmid like extra chromosomal elements by acquiring a mechanism that enables their dissemination between host cells that is independent of cell-cell contact. Of course, that would be conjugation. Uh, mm. in, the, in this way, plasmid vesicles may represent an early host-dependent strategy for the propagation of some types of virus. So our current thinking is that uh, many viruses initially existed as 
uh, replicating elements in cells like plasmids or transposons. And then somehow they acquired a capsid or a membrane, and then they became a virus. And right. there's, there's they lots stole of, it from the host. Stole from the host. And if you look at, people have done this analysis, if you look at a lot of viral structural proteins, you can see that they arose from host cell proteins. There are lots of really good examples of that. So this makes perfect sense that this is an early phase of that process. You know, the next part might be, you know, stealing another host cell protein that, that allows cell attachment, or maybe it's even in here already. And, and uh, this is well on the way to becoming a virus. So mm-hmm. for me, this makes a lot of sense in terms of the theory of how uh, at least DNA viruses emerged from uh, host cells. One of the facets of this paper that I really liked is when they went back to the lake ice cold lake and identified other derivatives of this plasmid because then that works in lieu of genetics where you go in and make particular mutations they can ask kind of what are are the core functions of this family of plasmids so it was a a great first step toward doing some structure function studies that's pretty cool yeah i wonder if such things exist in bacteria right or have have they long passed on you know are there any? Is there any example or, for membranous ba- vesicles in bacteria? Because they do make particles, right? Certainly, and and for example, there's really nice work um, in E. coli showing that E. coli vesicles can deliver toxins to mm-hmm. host proteins mm-hmm. and other cargo through a, a membrane vesicle delivery mechanism. So it would we just need to invoke a way to get DNA into that right. compartment. Anyway, it's very. Very um, thought-provoking article. Yeah, great discussion paper, I would say, for a journal club. For sure. Or a podcast, yeah. right? <laughs> right. Or a podcast. <laughs> so the, the first author, Suzanne Erdman, um, I was able to communicate with. She was born in Gorlitz, Germany, and she actually started her career as a nurse. But she got very interested in microbiology. So after she finished the nursing program, she went on to university and studied biology at the Martin Luther University in Hal Wittenberg, Germany. And she's always been fascinated by the tremendous variety of microorganisms in the world, especially ones that live in extreme environments. So she started out with Roger Garrett's group at the University of Copenhagen. And that lab was working on heat and acid loving organisms that thrive in hot springs. So her thesis was analyzing viruses from thermal environments, especially uh, looking at the host uh, CRISPR immune system uh, to protect the host from these viruses. But then for her postdoc, she wanted to switch to the other end of the of the uh, temperature spectrum. And so she um, contacted the uh, PI of this paper and started working on viruses or DNA, as we learned, in these extreme cold temperatures. And she got an EMBO fellowship to support that work and then has continued for another year. Currently, she's applying for research grants designed specifically for new investigators in Europe that would allow her to uh, launch her own research group. So I always ask now, um, do you have any advice for more junior colleagues? And so she pondered that a bit and said, you know, research can be challenging, but she loves her work and finds it's both a job and a hobby. She wakes up every morning looking forward to getting into the lab, knowing that she could find something completely new or unexpected. And she says, of course, this isn't usually what happens. Most days are pretty normal and lots of routine work and failures. (laughs) But once in a while, she does find something exciting, and that's what keeps her going. And as she reflects on it, she says there's really no other job than scientific research that offers that opportunity of, of true discovery. And we certainly saw that in this beautiful paper that Vincent described. She says she's lucky to have family and friends back in Europe to support her um, despite the long distance and her ability to only visit rarely. And uh, currently, she loves to spend a lot of time when she's not in the lab doing outdoor activities, uh, mountain biking, beach volleyball, surfing, rollerblading, hiking, jogging. And that's how she can relax and, and really clear her head and refresh her mind. Cool. That's, that's Susanna. You know, sometimes you have to look in unusual places. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and you'll find new, and you just think, I mean, we, well, we don't, I don't look anywhere. I just work in the lab, but you know, you go to a, an extreme environment like this and who knows if they're not very well explored. So who knows what you're going to find? You just don't know where the next uh, discovery is going to come from. So that's, that's yeah, and, cool. and 
one that we're all, many of us are dependent on is the discovery from uh, thermal vents in yeah. Yellowstone, I believe, of the enzyme that we now use for PCR and the whole process of PCR. That so, wasn't that, who, who was the guy? That was Tom Brock. Tom Brock. Tom Brock at Tom Wisconsin. Brock. I have on my shelf, Biology of Microorganisms. I used that in a college course. And he was the first guy who went out there and started characterizing the, the ma- microbes growing in those hot springs, right? Right. Indeed. Thermos aquaticus. Yeah, we are pretty much uh, dependent on that for a lot of the things that we do now. It's amazing. And and it's all serendipity, right? That's the thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you just yeah. don't know where the next thing is coming from. So I believe Dr. Brock took his students out on summer trips out to Yellowstone to do yeah. a discovery workshop. That's great. And they would isolate organisms from the hot springs. Sure. And why not? I yeah, mean, so many cool questions, and why not go to Antarctica? <laughs> Everywhere else, right? <laughs> well, you have to do that in the winter because you know our winter is their summer, and you don't go to Antarctica in the winter. Nope, nope, too cold. Although some people might. Well, you can't get there. Can't, get, can't there. get there. The planes don't go. Mm, okay. So once the planes leave at the end of summer, they're they're shut down until spring of the following year. Mm. All right, we have a couple of uh, email for you. The first one's from Anthony, who writes, In TWIM 71, Professor Schmidt posits that research in the human microbiome begins with the question, who's there? Do you remember TWIM 71, Michael? Vaguely. <laughs> I got to go look at it. See which, what it was. That roster very likely will be a who's on first, what's on second, taken to the nth degree. When, as you That's- mentioned, interactions are considered, the task of explanation appears daunting. Whenever the keys indeed are found under the streetlight in the form of a phage, that will make solution discovery tractable. Stool transplants sometimes seem to have about as much theoretical framework as the funerary cannibalism of the four people of Papua New Guinea, and similarly risky, too. <laughs> well, you know, that's that's the big issue that, they're, that the FDA is pr- principally tackling. Who will be a good stool donor and what should you screen the stool for? Yeah. And that's a major expense today in preparing the donor stool is actually characterizing it for pathogens and cryptic viruses and all sorts of other things. So Anthony asks a very good question and one that the FDA is wrestling to answer. He sent along a link to a paper uh, in Gut, a journal called Gut. And its title is Bacteriophage Transfer During Fecal Microbiota Transplantation in Clostridium Difficile Infection is Associated with Treatment Outcome. So in this paper, they find that the phages that you put over with the stool transplant can make a difference in the outcome of the transplant. Not surprising, right? Favorable or unfavorable difference? Um, In this case, uh, favorable. Treatment response was associated with a high colonization level of donor-derived cordovirale taxa in the recipient. So, you know, the phage may kill off non-beneficial, harmful bacteria. Who knows, right? But they didn't go into any mechanisms. They just say that the treatment response um, is influenced by the phages that go over with the stool transplant. So, and of course, that's going to vary, right? Mm-hmm. And you have not a lot of control over it. I don't know. And it's not something we screen for medically. We don't ever characterize whether or not someone is infected with a phage. We look for toxins, but we rarely look for phage. Yeah, so recipients who got feces with a higher richness of of phages uh, were all cured, and uh, the ones that had lower richness had disease recurrence. So, Michelle, it's Mm. it's a favorable. Phage are favorable. (laughs) In this study, I wonder if they're taking out some of the inflammatory microbes in the yeah. recipient. Could be. Yep. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, Anthony also sent another email in TWIM. Though in TWIM 157, Dr. Schechter was mistaken concerning the brand. Calcium carbonate indeed is an ingredient in antacid remedies. And he sends a photo of a uh, a cat with a bottle of antacid. Calcium carbonate, 500 milligrams. A cat named Blake. Cat named Blake. Nice looking cat. I guess the antacid is not for Blake. It's for Anthony. could be. It could be. <laughs> All right. Justin writes. 
Dear Twim, a quick comment on episode 158. There was a brief diversion into animal prions while discussing the PNAS paper on prokaryotic viral sequence in the brain. Someone, I won't mention any names, said that bovine spongiform encephalopathy, BSE, was created when scrapey from sheep passed to cattle through contaminated meat and bone meal in the UK. This was an early hypothesis that has not been supported by studies conducted here or in the UK. The scrapey agent will cause disease in cattle after intracranial inoculation, but the pattern of lesions can be differentiated from BSE, and the molecular profile is different than BSE when examined by Western blot. Attempts to infect cattle with the scrapey agent via oral challenge have failed, whereas oral transmission of BSE occurs readily. Admittedly, there are different options that have not been tested. There are different recognized strains of the scrapey agent. Not all of them have been tested for infectivity in cattle, and they probably won't be as these studies take years and are very expensive. Also, there are different prion protein gene polymorphisms that dictate relative susceptibility of sheep to the scrapey agent. Perhaps there is a specific genotype of sheep that makes prion donor better for as a donor to cattle. In summary, it's complicated and not as simple as BSE coming from sheep. Where did BSE come from? If I started on that topic, then this would no longer be a quick comment. <laughs> that's, that's a fantastic email. Yeah, it's good. Keep up the good yeah, work. Great. Justin is at the Virus and Prion Research Unit of the USDA in Ames, Iowa. So I let me just say, I, I agree with him completely. Now, if you look in Fields Virology, which is admittedly oldish, it says that... Um, it is widely accepted, this is a chapter by Stanley Prusiner, it is widely accepted that the change in the preparation of the cattle feed allowed scrapey prions from sheep to survive the process and be passed into cattle. Alternatively, bovine prions may have been present at low levels prior to modification of the rendering process and with the processing change survived in sufficient numbers to initiate the BSE epidemic when reintroduced mm. into cattle. So it's a little complicated. As Justin says, it's complicated. Yeah. <laughs> I know, but here we often make statements, and yeah, I understand that uh, sometimes it's complicated. All right, one more from Peter. Dear Twim Team, greetings from hot, sunny, and humid Mersin, Turkey. Daytime temperature 33 Celsius and humidity 79%. Wow. That could be Charleston. It could be. <laughs> it could be Charleston. <laughs> I don't think this has been covered on Twim before. To interest young people in the issue of antibiotic resistance, Dr. Adam Roberts of University College London developed the Swab and Send Citizen Science Project to get people actively involved in the search for new antibiotic compounds. Members of the public to swab and send. Swabs taken from everyday objects in local communities are sent to his lab for analysis for antimicrobial activity, improving awareness of antibiotic resistance and contributing search for new products. So they have a Facebook page, facebook.com slash swab and send and uh, an article here. So that's basically a uh, crowdsourcing uh, natural product discovery when you look mm. for uh, antimicrobials and environmental microbes. That's interesting. Get people involved, right? That's interesting. Yeah. Cover wide territory. You don't just go to one lake in Antarctica, yeah, for example. Exactly. <laughs> All right. That reminds me of a college. I had a genetics course with um, Jerry Fink, who's a well-known yeast, oh, yeah. yeast geneticist. And in the lab, one of the things we did was to make, was to isolate yeast oxytrophs, that is, you know, yeast that need certain compounds to grow on. And he wanted all the histidine oxytrophs for his lab because that's what he worked on. <laughs> yeah, my PhD advisor was in Fink's lab, so I probably worked on some of those strains. <laughs> Maybe, but why not? get the, If you get any new ones in the class, right, why not use right. them? Right. Well, that is TWIM 160. You can find TWIM at Apple Podcasts. You can find it at asm.org slash TWIM or microbe.tv slash TWIM. Uh, most people I know listen to TWIM on their phone or their tablet and there are apps that you use for that. Please do us a favor, subscribe so that you get every episode when we release them and you can listen if you wish. That helps us a lot with our advertising. And also, if you enjoy what we do, consider supporting us financially. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute, and you can find different ways that you can help us there. And finally, if you have questions or comments, we love to get them. Twim at microbe.tv. Michelle Swanson is at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Michelle. 
Thank you. And you're teaching a course this semester, is that right? Yeah, for first-year students Mm -hmm. called Current Topics in Microbiology. So what I do is have them listen to a podcast and then look at the research paper. And then in small groups, they break down a figure or a panel Mm. and then present that experiment to the rest of the class. And we kind of build the paper that way. So it's a lot of fun. Are these mostly science majors? Well, they're... You know, they're right out of high school, right? They've just arrived on campus. So um, they haven't declared majors yet. Mm. They're pluripotent. <laughs> they're pluripotent. <laughs> it's wonderful. Yeah. Well, that's so I will cool. say, though, in speaking of new students arriving on campus, Michael Jess Miller is one of the first that's authors right. on paper that you met. So I just met her at our new student orientation, and she was quite excited and and expressed her appreciation for the thrill of being um, her paper being highlighted um, on that episode about uh, living in the stomach. Mm, Bacteria that live in the stomach, yeah. So Mm. what did her colleagues think of having uh, one of their new colleagues having already made it to the twim stage? (laughs) Something for them to aspire to. (laughs) <laughs> you bet. You bet. I suppose. Yeah. Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michelle and Vincent. And there, of course, the med students arrived weeks ago, right? The new ones. We- weeks ago. Yeah. And they they learn about infection control for me next week. Lovely. Yes. Yeah, uh, August is over. We are now into September and uh, the official end of summer. Back to the usual things. Well, nothing really changes for us, but. Football season, go blue. Oh, that's right. Oh, my. <laughs> Michelle, I was sitting in my car the other day, and uh, there was a car in front of me with a with a Michigan sticker. All right. <laughs> I thought of you guys. I, They're now, everywhere. Now and, then They're I, everywhere. now and then I actually see Michigan license plates here in New Jersey. Mm. I always think of Kathy and Michelle. <laughs> thank you. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society and Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Ray Ortega for his technical help. I also want to thank the sponsor of this episode, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. The music you hear on TWIM is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. See you next time on This Week in Microbiology.